January 12th, 2010, uh, a giant earthquake struck Haiti. Buildings were collapsed. Thousands and thousands of people were killed. Uh, property was damaged. Infrastructure was destroyed. Uh, many people suffered from different injuries and loss of family. Families were split up. Uh, many orphans uh, became orphans uh, that day. We know when we read scripture that this world has fallen. Uh, God didn't create it that way. Uh, Genesis 1 is very clear that God created something he saw as good. But in Genesis 3, we very also clearly see that humanity said, well, we can do better. And that led to what we call the fall. It led to sin. It led to brokenness in our world. So New Life is the orphanage where we stay, um, and on one side where we stay, there's like dorms and places where people can stay, and then on the other side of the compound is the actual orphanage. shocked to open up and see where we were. It was like paradise. I mean, I could do without the cockroaches and the rats, but it, it was still paradise. The people who stay in the guest house area um, get to participate in life at the orphanage in the evenings. I've built a relationship with one of the orphans over the three years I've been there. It's been really cool to get to know him, play soccer with him, watch him get better at English. It's a place where families in Haiti who maybe can't take care of a special needs child have somewhere where they can go and be taken care of. You are awesome! And I can remember some of the trainings we went to prior and just I started to visualize what I thought Oneville was going to look like. So I felt like I had some idea of what third world country would be like um, and maybe even a little bit what poverty could look like. And I really did not have an understanding of the level of poverty and what homes looked like, what sort of a neighborhood looked like. Um, and that was, I think that was pretty heart wrenching for me. Onaville is on the um, North Mountains 
of Port-au-Prince Plain, and uh, it was a desert hillside, and still is. And nobody was really living there, it was an empty space and owned by the government, and so they said, well, we can put some people there. Before the earthquake, there was 1,500 people living in Oneville. And since then, uh, there is over 15,000 households in Oneville. Uh, it has grown uh, exponentially due directly to the earthquake. Throughout its history, Haiti has had a lot of people step in, a lot of countries that have tried to change things. Um, and more often than not, those changes haven't been great. Um, they thought they were making a difference, but they weren't. And so one of the key things I think about um, and pray a lot about for Haiti is that um, they still need resources and help, but they need to be in charge. And they need to do their own development work. Somebody can't develop the country except for the Haitians. Um, otherwise, it's just paternalistic, and, and that doesn't help them. So as we look at these trips and everything, uh, Pastor Noel is in charge. He is the one that drives and decides what's happening because he knows his community. These are his people, and we just can't come in there acting like we have all the answers and know what to do. He's the guy. We work through him. He's kind of the guy that says this is how it's going to be, and this is how I see to serve my people. The first time we went to Onaville, we see we need to treat a lot of disease like it's kidneys and body, all kinds of infections. It's really about how can we help the people on Onaville um, develop their own community? What pieces of help do they need that we, who are a little more resourced, are able to help right now? Now, God helping with the of mission discovery, we have medical clinic. Now they are really improving. The difference between the first day we, were, we was there and now is very big. So uh, the trips that, that I help organize and coordinate are uh, medical mission trips where we go into Oneville uh, and at the direction of Pastor Noel, we set up uh, free clinics at churches. And uh, these clinics are, are very basic in nature. Um, so we're not able to do major medical procedures or anything like that. It's really kind of a, just a triage and we have very basic medicines. Most of it's over the counter um, and then some antibiotics. As we see uh, significant issues, we actually uh, give them money and provide transportation to a local hospital so they can be seen. Everyone who comes to the clinic starts where they get a blood pressure and temp taken and their name written on a ticket. And on the front of the ticket is everything the clinician's going to check off. Um, are they there for a bellyache, an earache, uh, sleep, blood pressure, anything like that. And they can write on the front of the ticket. And then on the back of the ticket is what they hand to the pharmacy of, this is what I want you to prescribe for them. The first three trips I went on, I was working in the pharmacy piece of it. And then being there, it just, I wanted to do more, and so this was the reason why I went into nursing school. So this time around for me going back was I got to see my dream kind of come full circle. So to be able to go as a clinician this time was something I can't even put into words. Bellyache. Did it just, how long has he had his bellyache for? My job was to see patients, assess their main complaints, what was going on with them, and diagnose and treat as best as we could. The contrast between America, American patients and Haitian patients is huge. Obviously, we had none of the high-tech, you know, surgical equipment that we're used to. We had bare bones and nothing else. Um, but the human body is a human body. Pretty much everybody that we come in contact with up in Oneville, because of the condition of the water, at least in the past, um, had some sort of parasite. You know, you get it from the water, you get it from food and open air markets, you get it from walking around uh, in shoes that don't protect your feet from mud and, and water and stuff. So that, 
kind of everybody's got two or three of those on their checklist. Um, so we do uh, a deworming or an antiparasitical medicine for everybody who comes through that it's safe for. And then we also provide them about 30 days of vitamins. And so between knocking down the parasites um, and providing them vitamins, their immune system gets a huge boost. And it's a very cost-effective way of helping these people in a very practical way as well. I think what happens is when we come here, we, we, what we do is we see, uh, we see people. We see Jesus in people. It's really easy to do that. I remember she came in and my, I don't know who it was. Someone was like, she's like 107 years old. She's 107 and she's here. It was, it was like a big deal, you know, she's 107 and she walked in. I think with a tree branch as her walking stick, fully mobile, smiling. It was crazy, like the 107 year old lady, she was just so happy. And I was trying to talk with her, but I'm, I'm, I'm so bad at cradle, so. I think you say her name Natalie, I think. Cause I looked at her sheet, I was like, I wanna know this woman's name. I was like, I just really wanna go sit next to her cause she was just sitting there waiting. And so I went and sat next to her and she started talking to me in Creole, which was another trend. And I had no clue what she was saying. She'd talk and she'd talk and she'd talk, and then she'd pause and she'd look at me and she'd smile. And I would laugh because I had no clue what else to do. Okay. That looks healthy, old but healthy. <laughs> But the cutest thing was after, um, when she was sitting after the deworming station, uh, she was sitting with one of those dum dum lollipops. And if that wasn't cute enough to see to begin with, she wanted to eat the lollipop, but she either didn't know or couldn't understand how to take the wrapper off it. So she kept handing it out. And when she, at one point when she handed it out, I took it from her and I just, it took the wrapper off, gave it back. And as soon as she got it back and realized there was no wrapper, it went right into her mouth. And it was the most precious face I've ever seen. She was the most joyful person we saw all day. She had the most energy, the most smiles. She just hugged you, squeezed your hands. She was so excited to have a lollipop. <laughs> she was just so beautiful. And I said, what is your secret to being 107 years old? And she said, well, I love the Lord and I come to your free medical clinics. <laughs> so it must be working on some level. <laughs> So the first time uh, I came to Port-au-Prince, I came out as an intern because I thought it'd be a fun time. Uh, I thought it'd be something new and I was kind of itching for an adventure, I guess. And I was really struggling here. I saw a lot of poverty and I didn't totally understand what was going on. Uh, it was a lot of brokenness. I didn't understand why a loving God would allow that to happen. We were getting ready to close clinic. Someone said, can we get all the volunteers over here? He had hydrocephalus, uh, which is a disease where there's a lot of fluid buildup in the head, uh, and it puts pressure on the brain. Dr. Ron was with the young mother, and Maury asked us to come over, and we we're going to pray around this child and mother. Um, so we raised our hands and we gave it over to God and let him take charge of it. We heard that in the States, that would be able to be treated when you're born, but having to have um, Ron tell the mother that her baby's not gonna make it much longer than two more months, 
it was just a really like hard weight to bear just to see the circumstances that the people in Haiti are in and the circumstances that we live in. Um, it's hard to compare ourselves with them. At, at the end of the day, um, in the evening, we always get together for a time of worship, a little bit of a message, and then some small group time. And the, the reason why we do that, um, one is just to worship God, be before Him. But the, the thought of the, the message and the small group time is, is people have experienced all of this stuff. They've, they've seen things that they're not used to, they've seen poverty, they've seen, uh, again, health, health issues that would be no big deal in the states that that people are having to live with. And so they really need some time to process it in the context with others in, in community of uh, where's God in this? And what is he trying to tell us? Or what am I trying to learn through this? Uh, and we pray for this day is long and uh, long gave them all the news that this baby wasn't gonna make it and there was nothing that we could do other than pray. Um, said maybe one or two months. I haven't done a clinic where we've had to get that news to someone. And I just, um, I was in the room, um, kind of preparing for the night, and I just had this heavy this on my heart to his mom, and I talked to Maury about this, and Maury said, you know, Ron gave her this news, and she became paralyzed. She couldn't move. So I felt like we just put this on the wall, and I'll, uh, if you know the words of the song, you can sing it. You don't have to. But I'd like for us to spend about five minutes um, in prayer for this child, for this mom, for this family, baby Jonah, for mom, or his mom, and his family. They have a twin. You have a twin? Do you guys mind if we do that? I, I love the analogy that, that Melissa gave us um, of Haiti being a, a thousand or maybe it's a 10,000 or a million piece puzzle. And this week we got to put one puzzle piece on, right? I remember a story a long time ago about a puzzle that, that a child was trying to put together and it was really difficult for them. And their parents saw the frustration and stuff and left the room for a while and when they came back the puzzle was done. And the parents were amazed, what, what, how did you complete that so quick? Because it was like a, a picture of the world. And the little boy said, well, I found that on the other side of the puzzle was just a picture of a man. And I could put that together really quick. And then when I flipped it over, the world was in place. You guys did amazing things this week. Some of them were easy and fun. We, we met some good friends, we had some laughs. There were some incredibly difficult moments that are gonna sit there and ruminate with us for quite a while. Here's the thesis of, of Philippians. His thesis is, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I don't think this week you guys did just a little. You guys know what all these things are, right? These are all the slips of 2,049 people this week. 
in the States, we would have handled things different. But I want to say to you, I firmly believe that every one of these slips represents a changed life. Medically speaking, maybe it's not that big. But from an eternal perspective, every one of these people were prayed for, prayed over, touched, their names were used, and they, these are folks that their names are not spoken to them except for their maybe immediate folks, because they don't, a lot of people don't think they have worth. And so I, I, I know that this represents an eternal reward and a huge impact. And it may be a small puzzle piece, but that puzzle piece wouldn't have been put in place if you weren't here this week. There's this verse in Job that's really powerful, and Job's gone through all this trouble and things like that. He finally gets a chance to talk to God, and, and God shows up in a big way. And what happens is uh, the statement that Job makes after God speaks to him is amazing. He says, uh, my, my ears had always heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And that's what happens when you go on a mission trip. It's like, yeah, we've heard of God, and maybe we've seen him working in other places, and we've seen him in our own lives. But what we do is like, our eyes are open to a whole new aspect of who God is because of how we see Him in the people in Haiti or wherever it is we go. God's at work all the time and being able to go on these trips shows us how God's at work and if, if the world was perfect then we wouldn't be able to see God's work and we wouldn't really be able to acknowledge Him and praise Him for all that He does for us. coming because we love them, right? So they know that we're coming because we truly want to serve them um, and help them. In the end, for them to know and to see, you know what, there's people out there that do care for us. We, we're not forgotten after such a tragic event of this earthquake. Because they're seeing us working with the Haitian church, they also understand that there's something deeper going on. There's a reason why we're here, and there's a reason we're working alongside this church that's sitting in the middle of their community. And it's amazing to watch God transform this community in a way that we as, as humans with all of our stuff could not do, if, even if we brought everything we could possibly up into Oneville. And God is doing infinitely more by planting His church there. And that's the real nature of this, this clinic, is connecting them to a church, where they can get their needs even better covered. The people that come here to serve, they come here on purpose and they come here um, kind of in the mindset of, with the mindset of like, Haiti needs them. And what we find as the week goes on is that really we need Haiti just as much as Haiti needs us. I think after the first trip, that squashed my thought of, oh, what can I do for these people? But coming back from that first time, it, it, it changes. You're like, wow, I, I needed, I needed them to show me what's important, what is important in life. And I wish that they knew how much that they blessed us and changed my life and helped me through a hard time even when I was meant to go there to help them through theirs. Good and bad uh, become much more relative. It's not how I would have defined it before I left, but when you see people who are finding joy amidst the poverty, it kind of rubs up against what you know to be true. We were showing them Christ's love, and they were showing us Christ's love in return. Also, I love the medical trips is we're providing something that isn't easy to be provided, but it's something that over time, I hope we don't have to do anymore, um, that we're working ourselves out of a job over time. Haiti is some place special in the world, and we're so blessed to have gone there. 
their faith is unbelievable and uh, they, they know that number one they're passing through this world for eternity is that they all believe and know that and even with the suffering that they know that hopefully Haiti one day again will be a beautiful country as it once was. There's a lot more work that still needs to be done and there's a greater impact that I can help make and I want to be a part of these people's journeys. <laughs>